so much love and widen your um, your thinking instead of just criticizing the post without reading it. And at the same time, since we are uh, hopefully future communicators, we are telling them to do the triangulation, not just focus on one source, but also cross-check with other sources. And we appreciate Rappler so much because Right now, we have free data on Facebook, but not all news outlets online you can access because just because just you're on free data, we're on Rappler, you can check on that. While other media outlets, I think it's also good if they can provide access if you're just only using free data on Facebook. Thank you. All right, I think that's more of a comment. Uh, um, th thanks for that um, uh, um, intervention. So I think it, it speaks, the Digital Literacy Initiative speaks a lot about what Bishop Ambo spoke about earlier, about really knowing how we know what we know, right? So when we know that something has a lot of support and likes on Facebook, does that mean it is true? Um, do you know that that's not necessarily true, right? So digital literacy works and to help in that aspect. Um, any further questions? Hello, good afternoon. Paul from, uh, Paul from Now You Know. Uh, in uh, last, uh, last March, uh, we covered also the National Students Press Convention of the CEGP. Pinag-usapan din doon, they also talked about uh, social media rapidly evolving and developing uh, from the stage that it was just for entertainment and now becoming a venue shaping social discourse. Uh, of course, of so many issues. Now, I'm interested to know uh, if we have studies uh, stating or determining the likelihood of, of actually shaping discourse on ground through social media. So for example, in the upcoming elections, how likely it is that the names floating in the social media will actually translate on ground and that these names will be the ones losing and these names will be the ones uh, winning. So, uh, meron ba tayong studies na ganun na masasabi natin na this has actually become very connected now na uh, considering, of course, sinasabi kanina yung access that a majority of the Filipinos or at least a great percentage of the Filipinos still have no access in social media. So, how likely Parang how powerful it is, how, social how powerful is social media uh, to shape discourses on ground? And if, is, uh, if it's that so, uh, how important it is also na habang nagbabattle tayo, habang nag engage tayo sa battle in social media, we also engage uh, in battling fake news on ground. So that's the question. Hey, I think that's a good question. Um, any of our panelists? like to respond. I think there's two ways to read that question. He's speaking about the continuity between what happens online and offline, right? You could s s read this in terms of the positive, perhaps how, how positive campaigns online might transcend the online to the offline, but also perhaps how negative campaigns online might also move to the offline, to the physical. I'd like to tell a story about that. So remember when um, Lenny Robredo's head was photoshopped onto this la pregnant lady's pregnant lady in a yellow dress, and then umikot niyo rumor na, uy buntis si Lenny, so she must be an immoral person. So, when during the time that happened, there was a construction site behind our house, and I overheard the construction workers talking about it. So the origin of of that rumor was on Facebook, and it was on social media does on the internet. So it goes to show that what happens online can leak offline into meat space, a meat space as opposed to cyberspace. So there, there's a lot of crossover. And it's not just the elite now or the middle class who have access to the internet. For example, I was once walking along UP Teachers Village and I passed by a fishball vendor. You know what the fishball vendor was talking about with this customer? their Facebook accounts. So even the poorest of the poor sometimes have access to digital technologies. I also live near along a, a depressed area, and in that depressed area, it's a highway, there are at least seven internet cafes. So digital, has, digital K 
can and has penetrated the offline world. As for organizing in, in meat space, um, Tunisia has shown that social media can be a catalyst for organization offline. But um, at the same time, I think it's acting as a, as a pressure release. So parang, since a lot of people are venting on, online, the, the pressure to, that's, that used to be directed into the streets is now being dissipated online sometimes. So it's a good and a bad thing. Uh, for uh, online to offline, uh, there's a problem right now because, for example, sa, sa, sa company ko, we could not translate uh, online engagement into cash. So another example is that this singer, I, I forgot the name, he called people to occupy Luneta. What happened was they occupy a mango tree. So hindi mo, ang daming, ang daming ingay ngayon sa ano eh, ang daming ingay sa social media na hindi mo pa pwedeng ilipat i- i- uh, in real life, IRL in real life. Um, so I'd like to talk about the legal, um, legal perspective. And I know it might sound a little too legal or technical, but I'll try to make it as clear and simple as possible. So I think that there's a challenge in, a challenge of translating speech into tangible, something tangible in the real world. So for sure in international courts, judges have scrambled to connect a speech, a, cer- a statement, and offline, offline harm, such as murder. So for example, in the Rwanda genocide, um, there were certain individuals prosecuted for incitement to violence against um, et- members of an ethnic group in Rwanda. And it was hard for them to connect the, the radio broadcasts and the action of, a, because you have a speaker on radio, right? And presumably the listener of that statement is moved to kill or torture someone else. And it's hard to make that connection. At least, at least uh, international courts have really tried to, um, have really struggled to make that connection. How to connect speech, the impact of speech on real world tangible um, effects. And I think it's the same for social media because when you say something online, you see that there's somehow an impact on the real world, but you cannot really concretize it in the sense that, for example, how do you translate that into a legal truth before in a case, in an actual case? So at least from the perspective of law, it has always been difficult to make that connection. Yes, please. I'm, uh, hello, hi, ma'am, good afternoon. I'm John Samanheime from FINMA University of Pangasinan. Actually, I'm a student council president and I'm trying to relate you know, this seminar to what can we offer to our s- fellow students from Pangasinan. Because I was really confused because um, this information has been part of our, um, I- the part of the history, even during Marcoses, they use this information to deceive the people no, uh, even th- the past president until Duterte, meron na pong disinformation na nangyayari, di ba po? So, um, at, at this um, age, uh, information age, ang tinatawag natin, um, itong disinformation na to, dahil may technology, naging mas rampant yung paggamit ng social media no, to, ano, um, para kilingan yung interest, no, na interest ng kung sino mang interest yun. But for us youth, no, students, parang ganon, um, how do we empower our users, no? How, how do we empower our users? Kasi most of the people, no, are from the masses, no? Hindi naman puro mga n- from, from the, I mean, middle class and elite class yung gumagamit ng social media. But, mas pinakamarami is from the masses. So basically, they are very vulnerable sa mga fake news. 
So how can we empower them so that we can combat this fake news? So w we, that's a very big question. And how do we empower uh, the masses? Should the uh, initiative come from where? From, from the masses themselves? From NGOs? Mm. From government? From the platforms? So, ano, uh, you're right. Yung, yung this information is not a new thing. It, it has been there, but our technology has served to enable uh, itong disinformation. So because of a uh, few factors, one is democratization of uh, in, uh, content. So anybody could make yes. Facebook, Twitter, at kahit anong, at kahit anong uh, account sa social media, then uh, share it. So that's, that's one problem. And uh, while before, uh, news is only written by reliable uh, news sources, it is said that it's written on top of the mountains. Kung anong isulat ng bulletin inquirer star, babasahin niya ng mga tao sa baba. But now, baliktad na. Uh, users, the masa, has become the part of the newsmaking process. Yun na yung una. Uh, pangalawa, bakit maraming fake news and disinformation? Because of the incentives, economic incentives. The more click you get, the more money you, could, you, you will have. Pangatlo, uh, wide and immediate reach ng, ng social media. So, automatic yan, pag mag-experiment ka, meron kagad feedback. So, pangatlo, anonymity. You can be anonymous, you can be anyone, you can be anything sa, sa social media. So, uh, uh, ano, ang, ano ang pwede natin gawin? So, uh, I think we need to invest uh, in, uh, we, we need to in invest in and study uh, user education efforts. So, user education talaga ang, ang kailangan. So, mahirap ituro ang uh, skills like critical thinking uh, and the ability to fact check. So yun yung yun yung una natin ituro pero meron kasi tinatawag na uh, uh, parang backfire effect. So backfire effect is uh, giving people evidence that something they believe is false. It could backfire. So calling the voters who will vote for Bongo Bobo will make that belief in these people. Ah Bobo pala sige, iboboto ko to lalo. So meron 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 backfire effect na dapat natin ingatan when we teach when we debunk fake news. So dapat, dapat we, need, we need to know how to approach. And we also need to teach the users that technology can be exploited and how to spot these issues. So yun yung, yun yung mga pwede natin gawin. I, I agree with Art that it's really user education, but also we have to be critical about the platforms that we use. Um, we have to be aware. Part of that education, I think, is not just how fake news works, but also um, what are the interests behind the platforms, behind the different stakeholders, and what motivates them to do the things they do. Because we have different interests, right? And we shouldn't 100% trust corporations uh, who are really not out for public interest, but really their primary motive is economic. So. I think part of that education is knowing, I'm not saying that we do, we do not trust them, I'm just saying that at the back of our heads, we should be aware of the people and the partners that we work with. This is going to be really hard, but it's part of my advocacy at democracy.net.ph. Um, try to vote for candidates who have an ICT agenda, because I believe that having better access to internet will help the masses educate themselves because if you're stuck within fa free Facebook and then you can't, if you go outside of Facebook, the your cell phone will, will tell you you're about to leave Facebook. You will incur incur data charges. So your your tendency is to stay within Facebook and not check the websites outside of Facebook. So if you're able to um, visit all of those other sites when when internet becomes more affordable. You'll be able to fact check easier. Kung totoo ba to, you'll be able to check multiple news sites if if this piece of news is real or not. Because if it's one source, lang tapos galing sa blog or whatever, malamang fake news yun. So yun. Um, mom, can I have another question? Uh, yes. Yeah. Because um, just for clarification, when we say disinformation and misinformation, um, like for example, in um, our from, for our, from our journalists. Kasi um, may tendency kasi like for example when we yung ibang mga 
uh, I don't want to mention the the ano the media. No, um, like for example, nanood ako ng isang uh, debate ng kandidato. Tapos itong um, sa mainstream social, uh, sa mainstream media, naglabas siya ng fact check. Ang fact check niya lang ay yung mga isang particular slate lang ng isang particular na ang panito, uh, slate ng isang candidacy, pero hindi niya fact check yung iba. So that's another form of parang misguiding or misleading the public, di ba? That's, that's another way. Pero sasabihin natin, totoo naman lahat yung sinabi niya. Pero hindi naman siya. In a context, yung sa full context niya, parang may ibang message na pinaparating. So we, can we call that also disinformation? Second, tas for nabawa, ang naging biktima din po ako dyang mga trolls kasi I used to, you know, um, um, give my comments sa uh, Philippine Daily Inquirer about Bataan Nuclear Power Plant, tapos biglang marami ng mga nagsasabi ng bad things about uh, me, parang ganon. So parang no, hindi ako empowered kasi parang mas natakot ako, hindi na lang ako magkocomment. Kaya ngayon hindi na po ako nagkocomment sa, sa, <laughs> sa, sa mga ganong mga platforms so, sa, sa Facebook, like for example. Ka, yung mga ganon po ba, ka, can we, ano, parang like for example, yung si President, halimbawa, nagsabi siya ng andaming bagay, tapos there's one certain portion na sinabi niya na hindi nga talaga totoo or bad things or bad mouth na nanggagaling sa, uh, bad bad words na nanggagaling sa kanya mouth so that will be sensationalized by the social media pero the other context na sinabi niya hindi naman parang nag-appear parang ganon can we call also that misinformation or disinformation selective did you want to did, does anyone want to respond to that yep Kulang, wala sa context yung ano eh. So, if it's out of context, it's a misinformation or disinformation. So, so it's not only the facts that's being, you know, um, put on a certain article, but also how you put that in the context. Yeah, like, like what happened, uh, yun sa example ko. The story from Manila Bulletin was in 2018. The story from Rappler is February 2019. So, obviously, pareho silang tama eh. Pero out of time na yung, luma na yung sa bulletin bago yung sa Rappler. So Rappler is not being biased. Rappler is telling the truth. Pero yung mga tao, sinasabi nila, ah, mali si Rappler kasi tama si bulletin. Hindi biased si bulletin. When in fact, that's an old story. So selective. So it's part of this information and misinformation. Thank you. Yeah, I think the, li the line really is intentionality, right? So the intention to deceive. And I think in the context of fact-checking, what fact che Fact checkers have kind of a list of news that are thrown at them because, because people would like them to fact check them. Right? So it's on the basis of what th those, and I think also on the basis of virality. So those kinds of news that, that hit a particular um, uh, level of readership will automatically get thrown at them for fact checking. So in, in that sense, th there, there are criteria um, th 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 that makes a particular news to be fact checked by, by, by them. So in, in that case, um, we ask whether are they being selective about the news that they're fact-checking or is it because this is the system that, 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 that kind of triggers what should be fact-checked and what shouldn't be. So if we want all news to be fact-checked, then perhaps we should report them if we feel that a particular piece of news is problematic or doubtful. Uh, Nas, did you want to respond to that as well? Um, I'd just like to add something about the, the comment about trolls. So that's what the trolls are doing. It's called the spiral of silence. So because of what the trolls are doing, people are afraid to speak out. They're afraid of being trolled. So it's, it's, really, it's a really hard problem to answer and how do we fight the trolls. You can, you can be silent or you can choose to speak out and not be silenced. So I don't know, it's, it's a hard question. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we're, we're, I'm getting a signal. Okay, let's accommodate one final question and then we go for a wrap-up. Hi, I'm Christine Sabilia from ABS-CBN. I wanted to ask, um, what measures do you think have been effective in combating uh, disinformation? Um, it's good now that I'm seeing a lot of fact-checking groups, you know, not just from local um, news organizations who have banded together, even from international, like the wires, um, who are helping answer the disinformation in uh, local politics, for example, but are people really clicking on those fact-checking articles and reading them? And do you think uh, uh, it's important to 
uh, take note of the platform as well. So for example, a speech is given by a politician. And, uh, I think every day there's a falsehood being you know, aired um, on radio or television, anything live. Um, do you think uh, this should be answered through broadcast as well or through video as well? Um, and I think in the US, uh, what they're doing is they're actually having commentators, you know, uh, have a fact check team actually wait for the speech to finish, for example, and then actually mention uh, the things that they already know that are wrong. Um, because I don't think the articles were able to actually answer all of the falsehoods, and I'm not sure if the audience who watched that were actually are actually able to read the articles that circulate maybe three hours or maybe a day after the falsehood was aired. I'd, I'd like to make a comment on that. Studies have shown that falsehoods are more viral than fact checks. Mas sexy sila eh. So, and fact checking tends to be a bit dry. So it's, it's a really, really hard problem. <clears throat> As for falsehoods being aired, there's a school of thought now that people who air falsehoods should not be given a platform. So when this certain politician says something absurd, maybe the media shouldn't cover him and not give him a platform to spread misinformation and disinformation. So these are hard questions. Yeah, I think that's a problem. Um, what, what happens is reducing the visibility of the, of the content. But if you have seen it, you can no longer unsee it. So, ang, 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 ang nakikita ko lang magiging problema niyan, we will be living in a fertile, uh, uh, filter bubble. So, we're, we're thinking that what, what we receive is, is right kasi hindi na natin nakikita yung ibang, ibang points of view, kahit fake. So, what I do is I don't, I don't block anything, I don't block bashers, I don't block trolls. Kasi, uh, uh, yun nga, ang maging problema natin pag nandun na tayo sa, sa filter na yun. So what what you need to do is that uh, I personally I, I I read everything I read everything kahit to extreme. Um, I think what's also important is that I, what I see as the good news in in this whole thing is that um, social media platforms I feel are more receptive to ideas from civil society and they're more willing to listen. Uh, the fact that they've made a lot of improvements in terms of fact-checking and content moderation means that um, they're at least willing to change some of their policies. I mean, that doesn't make them completely innocent, but at least uh, they're receptive to new ideas. And I think that's why the role of civil society becomes even more important. Because, But we should also know what to demand from them. I guess um, I'm going to invite you to wrap up. So I, I have two final questions that you might like to address in your wrap up. Particularly for Art, you are a technology news editor of Manila Bulletin. What's in store for us in relation to technology and this crisis of disinformation? What do you see? I guess hard to predict, but any thoughts on that? And, and perhaps for, for, for the rest of our panelists, if you could speak about, so there's been a lot of recommendations or suggestions, regulate the platform regulate the user, make the user sign up first and register before participating in conversations. Which of these would you support? Which of these initiatives would you support? Or would you say that there's something wrong with the way we're seeing solutions about disinformation and technology? So, um, fake news detection alone, even done uh, perfectly, does not guarantee a defense against uh, fake news because humans have psychological and, and cognitive patterns, so sa bias pa rin ng, sa bias pa rin ng tao. Uh, in terms of technology, what we're doing now is that we're studying the traffic that's going to, to fake news sites, and we can say that uh, declining yung mga papunta sa, sa fake news sites because yun nga, nagiging critical na yung uh, pag-iisip ng mga Pilipino. So, and that's, that's, uh, that's a very good news. So, uh, but uh, these things are only happening now na merong, merong mga studies sa lumalabas. For example, in 2016, people would say Trump was elected because of fake news. Diba? So, Trump down na elected like, fake But uh, recent uh, information shows that walang effect ang fake news sa pagka-elect kay Trump. 
So new, new, new information that we could get uh, now. Also, uh, uh, I have recommendations to users on, uh, on what to do. Uh, I have three recommendations. First, be skeptical of content you see on the web. So pag it's content from an own source, wag na kayo maniniwala. So I always, the first day of my journalism class in Letran, I tell my student to double source. So what's double sourcing? One, pag meron kang nakitang, nakitang event or something, you need to find another source that would, uh, that would uh, uh, support or disprove the claim of that source. So double sourcing tawag doon. There are only two things that you don't need to double source. That is if you are a witness to, the, to, to what happened or it came from uh, an official uh, letter or from the spokesperson of the agency. So number two, don't assume everything is false. Kasi false nga siya. So ah, wala, fake news kagad to. So again, double source. Uh, look for the first uh, source. Uh, where, that, where, uh, where did that news come from? And uh, number three, be aware of your own possible biases. So, and, 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 and detect. Dapat malaman mo if, if this is being manipulated. If you get mad at something, it means pwede kang i-manipulate. And when you're manipulated and you, you confirm na, na may bias ka, time's up daw. Anyway, uh, na, na may bias ka, people could target you online via ad. Facebook, Twitter, so pwede kang i-target as an individual. I'm gonna make this short. Um, I think it's going to be to get worse before it gets better. So I'm in a wait and see mode with regards to elections. After elections, we can see whether this information really did affect elections that much or whatever. And then I agree with what Art said, be very skeptical of what you see in the internet. Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. Um, so what I, what's in store for the future? So I want to address regulation. Um, I want to make two distinctions. So between two kinds of regulation. One is content regulation by the platform. And the other one is regulation of the platform. And the question there is who regulates that platform? So with respect to the first um, kind of regulation, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression actually released a report saying that content moderation policies such as the community standards, community guidelines, should follow human rights law as a co because it will provide a common vocabulary for all stakeholders, users, states, uh, civil society, even non-users affected by the community standards such as victims of persecution and uh, victims of hate speech. So there's th that move that was released uh, last year. Um, and the second kind of regulation is regulation of the platform by, but by whom? As I said a while ago, most of these platforms operate in countries where they do not have country offices. And um, I think that any form of regulation, whether uh, in international or whether it's most of these platforms are based in the US so whether it's US based or international should be aware of the specific circumstances of countries like the Philippines where the governments themselves are heavy Facebook users and most of the platform infrastructure is used and to perform official functions and public services everyone for your questions. Once again, we'd like to um, thank uh, the panelists of this uh, particular session. That was Art Samaniego, Jan Domino, Carlos Nazareno, and the moderator, Cheryl Ruth Soriano. Um, before we move on to the next uh, um, item in our program, may we request those who are occupying the back seats to uh, sort of come forward so that we get a little cozier uh, in this large hall. 
Uh, once again, may we request that you move forward and occupy the seats um, on the first half of the auditorium. Yes, we'd like to invite you to come forward. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Before we move on to the panel discussion, we are now very honored and privileged to present you with an address from our former ombudsman. Please give a warm round of applause to retired justice Conchita Carpio Morales. Officers and members of the Com Consortium of Democracy and Disinformation, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant afternoon to everyone. Thank you for inviting me to the second conference on democracy and disinformation with a timely theme, Disinformation and Democratic Decay. It's been almost nine months since my term as ombudsman ended, I promised myself that I would refrain from accepting speaking engagements because among other things, I wanted to spend more time to my family, especially to my grandchildren. There is, however, a pressing need to explore more areas on integrity and anti-corruption, reach a wider audience, and evolve a broader set of sectors in nation building. Thus, I welcome this opportunity to speak before you, not as ombudsman, but as a plain citizen Conchita. I am aware that your consortium is made up of soldiers of truth who possess the most lethal of all weapons in today's post-truth era, facts, reliable, timely, and unfailing facts. Because of this, you have become individually and as part of your respective organizations, enemy number one to the purveyors of fairy tales and lies lurking in our midst. Please allow me to begin by preferring some questions. What can we show to the world to prove that we have institutionalized democracy in our country? Do average Filipinos understand the workings of democracy that they will be willing to risk life and limb to protect and preserve it? Are we Filipinos politically literate? I started with these questions not to impute doubt on the ability of our people and our leaders for critical thinking, but to call upon our citizenry, especially the thought leaders, to engage in individual and national introspection. Regrettably, this information has distorted reality and conditioned this otherwise freedom-loving nation in surrendering its rights to might, accepting intimidation as the norm in governance, dismissing human rights as figments of imagination and invention of criminal protectors, and ushering a realm of trust in the rule of law under the pretext of the dire need to effect the promise of chains swiftly, albeit unduly. Today may be the best time to do our personal and collective soul searching. 
because we now live in a world which the English novelist Charles Dickens aptly described in his 1859 novel, A Tale of Two Cities, as the best of times and the worst of times, the aids of wisdom and the aids of foolishness. In my keynote speech during the UP Law Alumni Association in November 2016, I explained the rationale for self-introspection by quoting what Sarah Chase recalled from a local during her assignment in Afghanistan. And I quote, the government is your face. It's, a, it's pretty or it's ugly, but it's still your face, unquote. I explain, as I explained then, the problem is not because of lack of mirrors, but because we do not take time to stand in front of the mirror and truth, excuse me, and turn on the light to see our faces clearly. Our country's democratic quotient has turned from bad to worse. Perhaps this highlights the urgency for us to stand up in front of the mirror with lights on now, to understand our struggling democracy is to identify and acknowledge the manifestations and root causes of our democratic deficits and resolve to address them. The rule of law is the bedrock of democracy, sadly. In many parts of the world today, the rule of law is being disregarded. Worse, law is being weaponized. Among us in this forum are victims of this legal aberration. Another cause of great concern are leaders who could not only, not only figure out what is legal and illegal, but also could not figure out what is morally right and wrong. The monstrosity of supremacy and the trappings of power aptly explain why leaders transform themselves into autocrats or dictators. Let us be reminded, no matter how highly we regard ourselves, there is still a higher order. There exists the overarching rule of law. The law serves as the proverbial lighthouse that guides our nations as it charts the course of history. It mirrors the matrix of values or mores of a given society as former U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren stated, and I quote, in civilized life, law floats in a sea of ethics, unquote. What keeps the law afloat is the supporting buoyancy of the underlying ethical values. The legitimacy of any law or jurisprudence for that matter would either be sinking or be setting sail depending on the strength of the sea of ethics on which it relies for buoyancy and resilience. Democracy provides the setting for everyone to exercise his or her inviolable rights. We must exercise our basic rights to protect and defend democracy. But the sad truth is human rights have become incomprehensible or distorted even among those who have sworn to defend it. What have our leaders done with our electorate? It is true that in a democracy, it is the people who are the ultimate sovereign. After all, only the people or the majority of them can check the leaders into power, elect the leaders into power to govern us all. By now, we have to realize that there is logic, no matter how perverse it may seem, why our people continue to elect wrong leaders. Patronage politics and corruption cannot exist without the other. If we are maddeningly mad with corruption, more so with patronage politics that feeds on it, I can only imagine that corrupt leaders would always rave with the unnecessary excesses and spoils of corruption. Please excuse the tautology. For those who may be outside this patronage politics, many remain apathetic to human rights violations and corruption, untouched 
as they live comfortably anyway until the next tragedy hits their home or until a loved one becomes the next victim. The linkage between human rights and corruption should not be forgotten. The late UN Secretary General Kofi Annan explained, corruption is an insidious plague that has a wide range of corrosive effects on societies. It undermines democracy and the rule of law, leads to violations of human rights. Corruption hurts the poor disproportionately by diverting funds intended for development, undermining a government's ability to provide basic services, feeding inequality and injustice, and discouraging foreign aid and investment. A 2016 study also concluded that when corruption thrives, human rights are denied, and correlatively, when denial of human rights continues, corruption persists. Disinformation and misinformation are forms of corruption. It is not difficult to explain why narratives on human rights and corruption are among the favorite topics for fake news and hate speech by the enemies of democracy. The doctrine of checks and balances is under threat from those who cannot bear even fair criticisms. John Adams, one of the leading advocates of this doctrine and one of the founding fathers who served as the second president of the United States of America, 1797 to 1801, has said, a legislative, an executive, and a judicial power comprehend the whole of what is meant and understood by government. It is by balancing each of these powers against the other, too, that the efforts in human nature toward tyranny can alone be checked and restrained, and any degree of freedom preserved in the Constitution. Having served the executive branch and the judiciary, I am inclined to conclude that the balance has tilted against the judicial branch. While the 1987 Constitution enshrined judicial activism through, among other things, judicial review of actions and decisions of the two other branches, much is still has to be done to promote the independence of the courts. Hence, and here I am, I'm reminding you of your recent statement, which characterized a frail and compromised justice system. I can't help but agree with their generous characterization. The absence of checks and balances mechanism plus a timid press present a clear and present danger to democracy. One just have to rule by fear and intimidation to impose tyranny. And we also have to deal with one improvement and that is one inconvenient truth. The upcoming elections on May 13, as we may unfortunately expect, may again be a manifestation of our people's political literacy. I am reminded that among the front runners in the senatorial election are some ex-senators whom I'd rather see faulted than elected. How could we miss the logic why people would still elect them? Apart from the promises of moons and stars and other ridiculous forms of entertainment, the people are just as perplexed as any political pundits. Why they remain scot-free and worse qualified political candidates in spite of their mayhem, to say the least. We could not really fault if majority of our people could only think and the only way to extract real benefits from exercises their power to elect is to put part of the gravy train of patronage politics. The less privileged, or what they call the great unwashed, is not alone for the blame. Arguably, the truth should be weaponized to the full extent of shaming these candidates and their enablers to prevent them from running. If the wheels of justice seem derailed or too slow to catch them. 
Being communication professionals and scholars, I am sure you are much aware that the advent of new technology, especially the social media, is one of the most in important inventions of the 21st century that has capability to rebuild democracy. The ubiquitous Facebook, for example, has provided everyone, or shall I say anyone, even those below 13 years old, which is the Facebook requirement to open an account, an easy platform to let their voices be heard. In October 2018, Business for Social Responsibility, or BSR, released its Facebook Commission study, Human Rights Impact Assessment Facebook in Myanmar. The report noted that Facebook has been described as having a power democratizing, powerful democratizing effect in Myanmar by exposing millions of people to concepts like democracy and human rights, increasing accountability for lawmakers and enforcers, and providing a communications channel for political representatives and their constituents. It also provides a leading a le learning platform for human rights activists, which improves civic participation and empowers civil society. But as we are all aware, the use of Facebook also has many downsides. No less than Ms. Yang Ki Li, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Myanmar, was reported to have said, I am afraid that Facebook has now turned into a beast and not what it originally intended. What prompted the UN Special Rapporteur in Myanmar to give this opinion may be the many documented reports on the use of Facebook to spread rumors about people and events which have been associated with communal violence and mob justice and the proliferation of fake accounts and news pages by organized groups to spread hate speech fake news, and misinformation for political gain. Many of these observations may very well apply to our country, which has prompted many organizations such as yours to push back to reclaim sanity and order in our virtual public space, and for Facebook to be more serious in enforcing its community standards. The advent of social media saw the birth of post-truth discourses where emotional impact rather than truth is what matters. There is a lack of demand for truthful and honest discourse. Social media has become a searing battleground for propagandists, apologists, and more alarmingly, trolls and bots who foment discord among a vulnerable and ill-informed population that acknowledges Google as the sole and primary source of information for just about everything. But what attracted me most in the Human Rights Impact Assessment 2018 report is the observation that the use of Facebook and smartphones proliferated even before the public has learned some form of digital literacy. It noted that the majority of the population lacks the digital literacy to effectively navigate the complex world of information sharing online. By the way, I was told that in Myanmar, the internet is Facebook, as all internet users are Facebook users. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Messenger, Viber, among others, all add to the discordant voices around us. Amidst these loud divergent views, or shall I say noise, and the incessant hurlings of invectives, there is always room to listen to the voice of principled reason and the heartbeat of an impassioned conscience. After all, truth is not measured in decibels by decibels. According to Noam Chamsi, in the right hands, social media and other technological advances would be a highly democratizing device. It could help eliminate the core of the whole system of authority and domination. However, 
It is not going to develop like that on its own. People will have to organize and fight to make that sort of thing ever happen. If fight, if fact fight very strenuously for it. I fully support the promotion of media literacy to make our people more discerning and responsible, not only in terms of media consumption, but also sharing of media content. Media literacy is one first line of defense. It's our first line of defense. It has both immediate and long-term impact. But let it be made clear that media literacy should not be used as an excuse to curtail freedom of expression. I thus appeal to your consortium to hold steadfast to your most essential goals, pursue, defend, and protect the truth even if many others have chosen to do otherwise. Find the truth and expose the lies. By advocates of truth that will empower a nation and its people to break the bonds of helplessness and wake up from a world of comforting illusion. Our democracy is sick and truth telling is the only antidote. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Justice Morales. May we ask you to remain on stage as we call on the uh, panelists of the following um, session. Uh, we'd like to call on um, uh, Rachel Khan of the University of the Philippines, Glenda Gloria of Rappler, Jane Uimatiao of Blogwatch, and our um, moderator, uh, for this afternoon session is Stephen Butler of CPJ. Actually, why don't, why don't we move toward the center a bit? And okay. okay. I've been given permission to call our distinguished guest, Conchita. So uh, thank you very much for that uh, inspiring and informative address. Um, I'd like to start a little bit by discussing um, I think th th the uh, deterioration of democracy is something that's happening in many places in the world and also in my country. And I, I think I, yeah, the United States. Mm -hmm. I grew up believing that our Constitution is what protected our democracy. And to a large extent, you know, that's true. The Constitution provided a framework for three branches of government and how they were to interact. Uh, but what we've learned is that the ability of that democracy to function depended on norms of behavior that were developed gradually over the more than almost 250 years of existence of the United States. But what we have seen in the past, I think, 20, 25 years is a gradual breakdown of those norms. I mean, the norms, uh, for example, that the President of the United States should not try to manipulate the administration of justice. Uh, norms uh, that, ec that brought an expectation that the ruling and opposition parties that would, would find common grounds in order that the legislative, uh, uh, legislature would be able to function. Norms that expected freedom of, that the press would be almost inviolate and not subject to direct attacks uh, by the chief executive. And what that has the function of doing is undermining the credibility of the press. And so we see in the United States uh, deterioration of the functioning of our democracy and a kind of paralysis uh, in many different ways. I'm not an expert on the Philippines. And so um, I, I'm hoping to learn as much from this panel uh, as, as perhaps all of you. Um, so let me start by 
uh, introducing uh, the other panels, Rachel Kahn of the University of the Philippines, Glenda Glory, who's the managing editor of, of Rappler, and Jane Umachayo from, um, from Blogwatch. Um, if we're talking about the deterioration or the democratic decay, let's focus on what it is we think is, 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 has in fact decayed. And perhaps we can just start uh, one by one. Jane, would you like to? Uh, first of all, I'm a, I'm a citizen. I'm, Blogwatch is basically a group of bloggers and citizen advocates. But I'm also a mother. And as a mother, I'm, I'm very particular about values that our youth uh, will be growing up with, what the future of the youth are going to be. I also used to be an auditor. So I was trained. Um, uh, to, to look for accountability and transparency. I am seeing all of these deteriorating. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very surprising that we demand so much out of our citizens and yet we are expected to excuse our government officials. For example, even before you enter a school, there are so many requirements that you have to submit. When you apply for a credit card, they're going to ask you for all of these documents. Or if you apply for a bank loan, uh, I used to work in a bank also as a bank executive. Uh, they require your income tax return. Uh, in, the, in the bank, we would have programs for our tellers and our tellers were required to take an exam to tell those who have, who may have issues with honesty. So we're, we're demanding all of these from our citizens. Why can we not expect the same of our government officials? Why are we required to submit our income tax returns and yet we cannot question the statement of assets and liabilities of our public officials? Why are we putting so much emphasis on hiring an honest teller who will be handling, I don't know how much money in a day she's supposed to handle, and yet we do not expect honesty of public officials who will be handling our national budget, which runs now into the trillions. As a mother and as a citizen, I am very concerned because um, there are many things that we want to instill in our children, and yet it is our very leaders who are doing the opposite. We are ex telling our children not to lie, but we see the lies coming from our leaders. So that's just something that I want to put out there. Uh, as a citizen, I'm really very concerned about not only where the governance is going, but also where the future, the moral fiber of our country and our soul as a nation is going. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Glenda? Jane. Hi. Hi, Steve. Thank you. Um, I think just to take off from, from your initial discussion on, on the norms in America, and then one morning you wake up and it's suddenly a new world. I think even among us Filipinos here, I myself, had always, even up to last year, would profess that we have normative preferences for democracy. Uh, we, after all, ousted a dictator 30 years ago, um, and that probably the democratic um, history and heritage is strong, and that will be marshaled when the time comes. But on the other hand, if you look at the president, uh, having been mayor for the longest time, and having had that style for the longest time and being allowed to do so provokes the question, do we have really uh, democratic norms or values as a society? Or, and I ask this as a question because I, ask, I struggle this with myself. Um, or that is Duterte the nationalist, nationalization of the boss politics that 
that we live with in towns and provinces where we tolerate warlords, we, to we tolerate bad language, we tolerate killings. It, it's not as if Duterte is new, it's unique to us. It's just that he's on national stage. And, and if you ask the locals, for example, yeah, they could vote for a warlord, for a known drug protector, but no, not the president. They'll reserve the presidency to the best and the most democratic, but th all that is gone. I think there's, that's the one thought that comes to mind. And second would be the democratic processes that we're used to over the years, the, the, the process of organizing, of voting, and I'll just limit it to three, organizing, voting, and debating. I think I am old enough to say that has changed. Um, the way we organize now has been also put to question because the democratic left has also been in bed with, with certain forces that, that have not been true to the goals of um, you know, development, for example. On the other hand, uh, it used to be that when a senatorial candidate would jump to number one, you can almost be certain that he either has a political pedigree, meaning he's, you know, he's a Manuel Rojas or anyone, or that he's a celebrity. But you have the prospect of an aide of the president who neither has political name nor entertainment behind him. Of course, he does entertainment now. Um, uh, they're at the threshold of being number one, and you ask yourself, what happened there, right? And these are the questions that we should be asking ourselves, because the world has changed, and the sooner we embrace that, I think the better for us. And, the, uh, and it has changed fundamentally because Technology has always been intertwined with democracy. I mean, not now, but even in the past, right? Like you know, the, print, the print industry, my, the elders, the fellow seniors here would know. <laughs> I mean, ganun naman eh. democracy, technology have always been. And now, because uh, technology is such that it has algorithmized lies, uh, then it has changed also the air we breathe. I think there have been discussions earlier on whether or not, well, should we recognize the fact that online hate actually translate to uh, offline hate? It does. I mean, look at the world, look at the recent terrorist attacks. I mean, it does translate to actual hate. What is hate online? And I think the sooner we st stop being in denial that platforms are not just tools. They're the air we breathe. And if it's the air we breathe that is polluted and angry, then the call for us, and that's the decay that, that we're dealing with. And it's a decay that I don't have the answers to. Maybe later on, we could have the answers to them. Thank you, Glenda. Rachel? Yes, hi, Steve. Um, thank you. Um, as a student in the 80s, um, we had already passed through the stage where we fought for democracy um, with rallies and, and all of that. And I thought that that was it, that was, you know, that we had imbibed and we had fought for democracy and that would be the last time that we had to step up and really uh, fight for it. Um, so it's kind of uh, jarring to find ourselves in the same situation, which was not so long ago, if you really think about it. Um, but th this time it's different. This time, um, back in the 80s, you could, for example, rely on certain institutions that you could trust. Um, people trusted, for example, the media. We could tell which ones um, we could believe in, um, where we could find the truth. Um, now the strategy is precisely, I think that's why we call it de democratic decay, because um, what they've done was to make the general public, those who are not so um, politically literate, to distrust precisely these democratic institutions that we should be able to rely on, such as the media, such as the courts, um, such as the Human Rights Commission. Because of 
by undermining their credibility, they are also undermining democracy. And that's what's really scary because they're using soft power to do it um, rather than before it was more black and white. Uh, at the same time, I think the, the real problem is um, the growing, let's say, philosophical attitude of relativism, which wasn't there in the 80s, um, in terms of even electing moral, morally upright leaders. Um, I see it even in the microcosm of the university. Back when I was a student, um, the only student leaders we would elect were those who um, were, you know, honor students or um, people that we respected in class or um, in both intellectually um, and as leaders. These days, it's quite the opposite. The ones who win um, for student council, let's say, are those who are actually failing in class. So I can see that that's already the beginning of, um, in a way, a microcosm of what's happening in the greater society. And, and it's, it's kind of alarming. What can I say but to say I concur with the observations of the panelists. Indeed, uh, it's alarming to see how democracy is crumbling. Be it's crumbling because we have allowed ourselves to be st stepped upon. We have not uh, asserted our rights. We have been scared to death. We have subscribed to Machiavellism. So it's something that we should be alarmed about and it's something that we, especially the young, will be beneficiaries of whatever is happening today should be uh, alert to fight whatever um, whatever um, disease the democracy is in right now. One of the, um, I thought, s startling remarks in, in your address was the, I guess, deterioration or weakening of the judiciary. And uh, perhaps our other panelists might comment on that, how they see it, how it affects them. Rappler, of course, is well. at the center <laughs> of this. <laughs> well, 11 complaints and cases. Yes, I think the, it's an old term, but you use it also, ma'am, um, the web, how the law has been weaponized over the years. And, you know, talking from our experience, and this reinforces not just uh, the dehumanization of, of the law itself, but precisely it reinforces also your cynicism that justice is for the wealthy. Um, it's not just a product of democratic decay because as an experience, for example, in Rappler, if you f you're faced with 11 cases and complaints, then how much money do you need to actually just even print your defense in terms of producing 25 copies per petition, for example. And we came face to face with that. I mean, my God, it's, it's expensive to be charged. It's costly. It's costly not just in monetary wise, but precisely psychological. And, and to say that it is just a rappler problem, I, I guess misses the point because precisely the impact I think I'd like to believe is um, a climate of fear, um, a chilling effect on, on our colleagues, especially those who actually could not afford to be charged with even just with libel or aside from the other cases. So I guess the chilling effect and the climate of fear are the most immediate impact of how the law is being weaponized now. How about you, Jane, even cybercrime? Well, also, it would be interesting to think about why if the judiciary was once a more respected institution, why has it changed? I think the justice can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the perception is that um, the evidence uh, that forms part of the records of a case are not really um, looked upon with credibility. In other words, um, the perception is that uh, it's no longer a case of looking at the merits of the case, but sometimes heeding to where the wind blows. In other words, it is disappointing to note that there appears to be a clear pattern 
of uh, voting on the part of a certain group. Whereas before, uh, during the times of, I'm not going to say during my time, because uh, that is not only self-serving, but that is also um, being modest. But uh, during the times of ju justices like um, uh, J.B. Reyes, uh, San um, Justices Sanchez, Justices, um, all of them. Maybe uh, still uh, we can look at to Justice Makalintal. Whatever decisions they made, they were respected. People believe that uh, they come through the pages of records. Unlike now, people believe that irrespective of the merits of a case, when a particular magistrate decides he or she does not really consider the merits of the case, I can be charged of being disloyal to the institution I came from, but at the same time, I have at the same time to protect the institution that I came from. And this, uh, this seems to be a, a theme that's come across that the sort of person who's being elected and put into office um, lacks the kind of caliber or lacks the, the, the credibility or integrity uh, of uh, earlier you know, from, from earlier periods. Is, is I think that's a fair summation. Wh why is that? I mean, is, is it because, is social media have something to do, it, to do with that? Is it the, you know, attacks on the media? Um, I, I, does anyone have any thoughts on it? Well, I guess social media has a lot to do with it. Um, it's instant, it's um, unfiltered, and therefore, whereas before, um, you could be then subjected to a lot of vetting um, precisely. Now you could form your own social media page, you could form your own megaphone, and that megaphone doesn't have to be edited, doesn't have to be fact-checked, and the distribution network is free and exponential. So there's that, that's a powerful tool. On the other hand, uh, we gatekeepers, we journalists already compete with a lot of voices. And so it is not, it's more than echo chambers, but it's really, we're stuck there. So w we're listening to each other, just preaching to the choir. We have our own, we are, it's a very polarized, it's very much like the States. It's a very polarized environment that we tend to, by human nature, listen to what we'd like, we agree with, right? I mean, we'd like to um, be um, uh, talking to people who do not necessarily disagree with us. And that has allowed room for a lot of, uh, pardon my language, a lot of the incompetent people because then they're not subjected to vetting, right? Um, and also, I think, for example, in this case and going back to certain uh, candidates, they have managed to really completely escape, not just debates, because debates, sometimes some candidates really skip those debates, but escape rigorous media interviews. They, they, are, they can be there without actually being interviewed by, by an independent media. And how is that possible? Because they have Facebook. And, and there's this issue earlier that, well, but is Facebook really our reality? It is, it is our internet. I mean, when 98% of Filipinos online are on Facebook, what do you call that? That's the air we breathe. Jane, do you have any thoughts? Rachel? Um, well, because social media, like what Glenda said, that we, um, the media as gatekeepers have sort of lost its main role, um, not being the sole gatekeeper. At the same time, while echo chambers do exist and, and people have lost interest, I mean, there's, it's, it's a ratings game as well. So even Facebook, um, the trends there, if, if your f news feed is all about entertainment, you don't even look into um, what is more newsworthy. Um, one of the things that social media has done is to remove the ranking of the importance of news. So a, a front page story would appear the same on your Facebook feed as um, a small story on an entertainment page. It depends on who's feeding it because of your friends list or, or whatever. So unless um, we teach and 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 Justice um, Morat, 
yeah. <laughs> um, brought up a very good point on, on media literacy um, where we do need to make people still go back to like the original websites, the original sources of information rather than depending on what is fed to them by social media. Um, so yeah, I think that's a problem. Um, uh, let me open it up for questions then. I'm, I'm sure that this is a, a wonderful opportunity for all of you to uh, ask questions of someone who's been an, an important force in the Philippine government for many years. So. May I ask the justice a question? Absolutely. <laughs> um, you talk about being a citizen now, and uh, I'm curious exactly how you intend to play that out in the coming years. Do you see yourself more visible, or maybe um, in, in dem democracy forums like this? I mean, what sort of role do you see now? Play I still play maintain my advocacy against corruption. I have always maintained that uh, what I could not finish in the office of the ombudsman, I want to continue it outside of the office. Of course, your question is in the coming years and the assumption that I will still be alive in the coming years. <laughs> I hope God gives me more time, more years, so that I can help uh, in fighting corruption because uh, up to now, corruption pervades. And uh, that is something that we had wished that it would diminish, but it does not seem to be diminished. Will you at all be lured into running for public office in the future? <laughs> I have always said uh, I'm not cut for politics. Uh, first, uh, before I retired, I was asked by at least two groups to join politics. I said the law prohibits an outgoing ombudsman to run for a public office in the elections following his or her retirement. Secondly, I said I'm not cut for politics. And do you think I will succeed given the number of people I have indicted, <laughs> given the number of high government officials, big fishes that I have put to jail? You're kidding. I also have a question for the justice. But does that mean that uh, since you have an advocacy for corruption, against corruption, that are you now going to be on social media <laughs> where most of the, where a lot of the people are? Uh, you know, social media is sometimes unkind to me. Sasabihin nila, matanda ka na, may lupa ka na. Huwag ka nang sumali dyan. So I'd rather be, uh, uh, you know, uh, out of sight. But uh, my voice will still reverberate in the corridors of power. No questions from the floor at all? Well, let, let me. There's their hands there. Feel free. Our experience is that the audience warms up after the first question, so there we go. Good afternoon, K. Justice Morales. Um, good afternoon, pa. Uh, Justice. Uh, since you spoke about uh, your advocacy against corruption, do you think there's a need for the wife of your nephew to uh, explain the 600 percent increase in their um, um, assets in the last few years? I'm do speaking about uh, talking about the uh, Davao City Mayor uh, Sara Duterte. Do I think that the wife of my nephew is supposed to answer the... Yeah, e explain, explain the staggering increase in their uh, assets as a couple. That's their personal decision. Are they obligated under the law since uh, she is a public official? Well, if she's indicted, she's supposed to explain how her alleged uh, um, increase in cell ends through the years came about. Uh, but before po, kung di po siya makasuhan, there's no formal complaint against her. She's a politician, so it's up to her to 
say whether she wishes to explain or not, because uh, there is no legal sanction against her if she wishes not to explain, given the fact that she is not indicted or she's not charged in court before the ombudsman or in court. Thank you for justice. Well, let me let me put a question, and um, uh, justice has indicated corruption as a continuing issue that stands in the way of full democracy. What are the other areas that might uh, be amenable to uh, you know, action on the part of you know people like you know, as not me because I'm not I'm not a citizen here, but the, the citizens who are here and elsewhere. What if we if there's an attempt to to restore the norms of democracy, and so that it functions better? What what are the things that need to happen? Um, I think what needs to happen first is um, for all of us to realize that. You know, back in the day, um, there used to be like walls. Um, we're journalists, we're bloggers, we're technology entrepreneurs. I think the challenge precisely is to come together and, and so that to craft a better way to, um, as the justice said, to soldier for the truth, right? Uh, but we are not, we are organized, but I think we need to work harder and to do more organizing, to be more inclusive so that this is not just a media problem or a technology problem. I think that's the most important challenge to me right now. And, and the most urgent task is to, to do a broad, um, to organize more broadly, but also using the tools available to us, which is really also technology. But on the other hand, match that with really on ground, real, t um, real people connection. I think ultimately that's the answer to that because I think now the situation is we've always been on the defensive, uh, receiving end of all these uh, offensives against media, um, against the public, uh, but we haven't really found the right uh, counter attack to it so that then a counter narrative that would say, actually, that is not the case. This is the one. And that has to be a voice among many. It's not just, that, that has to be represented by many voices and not just one voice. There's another thing that I see. Uh, being a predominantly Christian country, uh, I, don't th I don't know what, what was in the mind of the president, but if you start attacking the faith of the majority of a country, I don't think there's any way that none of these people will uh, speak up. And we're seeing that right now. Um, sabi nga nila, uh, what they say is the people are woke. Okay, so that's the, the millennials speak when people are woke. And I think what's happening is the laity are woke. They are woke already because we now see that there are people pushing back. You insult my faith, you insult something that I grew up with, I will not stand for it. And we're slowly seeing that because now, unlike before, when the laity were very, very quiet, like in the past elections, people were very quiet, I see that there is now a movement. Not only Catholics, we're seeing Catholics actually meeting already with other denominations. And they're moving as a group of ladies of different denominations. And we now see that even the Christians are reaching out to the Muslims and all that. So it's now becoming an interfaith movement. And to me, that's a new phenomenon that, that I'm still trying to observe. But for me, the lesson there really is, and I don't know why he chose to go in that direction, but I think with the kind of uh, faith and spiritual background that the Philippines has, you really cannot attack that without people pushing back. So that's what I'm seeing now. Um, we're just hoping that um, in many studies abroad, we're seeing that it did, that there is a pickup on yeah, being woke. Um, for me, it's a bit, it's going a little too slow. 
Um, and I think there's a lot of work from the academy, especially from the academe side, really to push more of um, media literacy and political literacy. And I think this should be a priority, especially for the peop the academe that are here. Um, this is where we have to go forward and, and just keep on going. Uh, okay. Um, this is for any of the... Can you identify yourself? I'm, I'm Bart Kingona of uh, Pagbabago at Pilipinas. Um, what, what, what I'd like to know is that um, it seems that uh, people... Uh, oh, oh, okay, let's just put it this way. Uh, Facebook is a vast sea of people. It's like high school. And what happens is that you find your own barcada, right? The, you, you have a group of, say, hip, Sisters, a group of stoners, a group of whatever, right? Uh, and you, you find your own little niche. Uh, it just so happens in, in uh, Facebook, for example, there's a group of white supremacists that are able to band together. Um, and my question is, because we are talking about democratic decay, is there are people who actually don't care about the truth. They actually disdain the truth because very often the truth goes against their narrative or the narrative that they choose to support. How now do you propose to convince people, uh, and I'm looking at uh, Father Ambos, uh, Bishop Ambos, er, er, earlier uh, keynote, how do you now convince people that the truth is still valuable in an age where uh, it's the personal narrative rather than, than truth per se? I think for us, is the first would be to debunk the lies. What the problem that we have now precisely is we've allowed the lies to go on, untested, uncontested, um, dismissed as, you know, it's just chismis or it's, it's only online. But when you allow lies to proliferate and go uncontested, then those will become the truth. And I think more than talking about truth in its abstract, it's that every chance you get, get whether you're a community or you're an institution or you're an individual, Every lie you see online, you have to debunk it. You cannot dismiss it. And that's something that it took us a while to actually even embrace as an organization because then, oh, those are just by the trolls, those are just machines, etc. But yeah, but people precisely believe the truth because there's no uh, false, the lies, because no one is debunking them. I think that's the first step. And we can move on from there in a more sophisticated manner. I think um, in, a, in a way, at the beginning of all this, we sort of let them in by allowing them to change the terminologies when they started talking about post-truths and we bought in and used their terms of post-truths and fake news. We were actually undermining the truth. And instead of saying there is only the truth and there is a lie, you know, but, but we created all these terminologies that, that fostered actually a distrust or a relativistic view of what is true. When, you know, if something is a fact, it's a fact. If it didn't happen, it didn't happen. Um, and without spelling it out as clearly as we used to, um, we had watered down our primary product of, of the news media, which is truth. John? Good afternoon. I'm John Neri. I'm a, uh, a columnist at the Philippine Daily Inquirer. My question is for Justice Conchita Carpio Morales. Uh, Ma'am, I don't want to get you into trouble with your fellow lawyers, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, you're one of the most respected uh, lawyers in the country, maybe in the last two generations, so maybe you would like the uh, challenge. Uh, qu quick context. In the last several years, journalists have been forced to think about 
what we've done, our own, to reflect on our own practices that have helped create the conditions for disinformation. And I think we, we can agree on certain things. Our need for speed, our addiction to authority, our bias for the big. Uh, my question, ma'am, is in what way have lawyers been responsible for eroding democracy in the Philippines? Uh, I obviously want to, to, uh, to uh, find out what we can do to encourage lawyers to uh, uphold the rule of law. But before that, I would like to ask, what are the common practices of Filipino lawyers that have in fact led to democratic decay in the Philippines? Some lawyers have in fact been the cause of all these lies. They allow themselves to be used by their clients to propagate lies. They don't uh, hear the, the code of ethics of lawyers. Instead, uh, some people want uh, publicity, and even when I really don't know if they're convinced that what they are saying is true or not, but uh, as I said, they are being used uh, by people to propagate lies, and they'd like to believe maybe in their subconscious minds that what they are saying is not true, but that because they want uh, to cater to their clients' wishes, and because there's a fee lining that uh, uh, engagement of their services, they are partly responsible for the decay of democracy. You have seen a lot of some lawyers who uh, represent rascals, and they uh, brazenly say this and that when what they actually are saying is of judicial notice to be not true. That's it. Um, are there other questions out there now? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. And so I call on upon lawyers to please uh, heed the code of ethics. I call upon them to help uh, treat this sick democracy because as I was telling earlier, telling the truth is the only antidote. Hello, is this working? Yes. My name is Marian Rosas, I'm with Pagbabago at Pilipinas. Uh, Justice uh, Morales, uh, in your address, it's clear that the link between disinformation, democratic decay, and corruption is clear in your mind. This is clear in my mind from a number of perspectives. Philosophically, I understand it. From a political science perspective, I understand it, uh, even culturally. I'd like you to address the legal perspective. If you could just enlighten us a little bit about the actual links that can be established between disinformation and corruption. That might help all of us. Thank you. You wish uh, to look at the legal aspect yes. of this. Of course, if you come up with false information, uh, that necessarily is linked to corruption because you are not only corrupting your own mind, you are corrupting the people to whom you are addressing this information. That's a form of corruption. Corruption does not necessarily entail uh, stealing money from the coffers of the treasury, as some people are charged with before the Sandigan Bayan. It also means corruption of the mind, corruption of, uh, of your morals, mores, and all that. It also means uh, corruption of, uh, of your views such that this borders on the legality or lack of it. And so, uh, as I will always emphasize, corruption and disinformation, this, not mis, and disinformation are really connected to each other. I'm Cheryl Soriano from De La Salle University. You say to understand the present, we need to look at the past. And we have lost our democracy once. And so um, I'd like this panelists to speak about reflecting on um, the stages before we lost our democracy. How could we look at what we are experiencing now 
in terms of the campaign for disinformation, what's happening to the judiciary, what's happening to the apathy of the people, how can we compare the present with what we have in the past? You said you lost democracy before? Well, we've lost it. You are referring to the? The martial law. Martial law, okay. Well, of course, martial law is a tool that can be allowed by the Constitution if warranted. So if uh, the declaration of martial law was warranted, uh, then you did not necessarily lose democracy. Now, your question, last question is? When you look at democracy as a system in which the people have their say in the way the government runs, and if you look at uh, how people's rights are trampled upon or are being stifled, not necessarily out of fear but because of uh, indifference, then that's the time that democracy begins to decay. So what should we do? to arrest that decay. We, I, as I said, we should assert our rights. We should not allow fear to overcome us. If you are afraid, then with more reason, your rights will be trampled upon. The more uh, you are afraid, the more you'll, you're silenced, and the more the powers that be will take advantage of you. And nothing can be stopped if you remain indifferent and silent. So I call upon all of you to raise your voice, to come up with dissent. It's not enough that you say, ay, ayaw ko sa kanya, talagang ganyan, ganyan. You, you should be counted. Your voice should be counted. You cannot say it in whispers. Don't be afraid. By raising your dissent, there is no crime committed. Unless, of course, they can invent crimes in order to silence you. I'm, I'm actually not new to the Philippines. I was here uh, in 1986 and 1987 um, when I was able to see the incredible power of the Philippine people when they decided uh, that they had had enough. And um, one of the most fundamental acts of democracy is uh, coming up very quickly here. It's, um, it's uh, the elections. And I'm, I'm thinking, what is it, the people who want to try to strengthen uh, Philippine democracy uh, what is it that should happen here? And, I'm, I'm, and many of you are media practitioners, and so I'm thinking, um, w what's important for the media to do uh, as uh, the Philippine people are you know, considering who to vote for? What's for the media to do? What, what's Im what are the important things the Philippine media needs to do to try to, make, to, try to strengthen democracy in this upcoming election? Well, um, we have done and we're doing our part in terms of um, vetting the candidates, um, exposing wrongdoing of candidates, at the same time um, introducing the new ones, especially focusing coverage on people who have no access to ad advertisement or s the social media posts that are paid. But again, it's, it's no longer the same. It's, we are competing also with the other media that precisely do not rely on, on fact-checking or do not publish verified truths. And, and there are a lot of other media out there. And so there's that. So again, I go back to, um, in, in, terms, in the case of Rappler, for example, we, we try to do our workshops outside Metro Manila and actually talk about social media for social good uh, before students, precisely out of the premise and out of the belief that we cannot do it alone at this time. It's not media's decision. This is not a media game already. It's more than that. And so the way to precisely um, promote um, awareness is to reach out to other sectors and for media to be more accessible, to talk more often about this and about uh, um, the standards of, of uh, good leadership 
to a wider sector. Uh, gone are the days that, you know, we just write editorials and we love reading ourselves and our, <laughs> our content, but those days are gone. I think as far as Rappler is, is concerned, we've really crossed that and, and say there's a bigger world out there that, that has to be um, engaged. Um, precisely one of the reasons we put up the check.ph is to um, correct or to verify the claims made by politicians. Because in their speeches, they make so many claims that many times are not true or not based factually. Um, so it's, it's an it's a uphill battle, and I think we need the public to share the research that we're doing. It's not enough that we're doing it ourselves. What is more important is that those who have read us and those who um, uh, also try to, to spread what we have researched, um, and that each citizen is also proactively seeking the truth. Um, that is what we hope to build with the check.ph and hopefully um, train people to want to know the facts. It's not as sexy as the lies, but it's the truth. And to give more value to the truth, that's what we are hoping to achieve with this consortium on, on verifying um, media uh, politician claims. I like the way you first said, train people to want to know the truth, want to know the facts. I think there's also more collaboration now, more than ever. Um, we even retweet each other, for example, in terms of content um, regarding disinformation, exposing the disinformation networks. If ABS has an exclusive on that, we have no qualms um, sharing that content on our wall because precisely um, we have to battle the, the universe of, of, of fake accounts that is more uh, noisy and more po even powerful sometimes than, than traditional media. And how do we do that? Then we have to band together as well and, 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 and fight that kind of um, battlefield. And so it's, it's, we've done baby steps towards that, but I think we all agree here that collaboration is the key and just um, making sure that our networks are multiple, multiplied so that then we have louder voices. Uh, on, our, on our part, uh, Blog Watch, one of the things that we're emphasizing on because we are a citizen advocacy group, and one of the things that's very important to us is really the empowerment of each and every individual, each and every citizen. Because in many of the talks that we have encountered, and my colleague here has been talking together, uh, you know, in front of groups of students especially, one of the things that we've noticed is that uh, there is a, a mindset of maybe being disempowered. Uh, there's a mindset sometimes that um, I'm only one person, I cannot do enough. So one of the things that we're doing as we go around talking to students is really to, to change that mindset. If, we can, if each of us can change our mindsets and realize that the power is within each and every one of us, that each of us has a voice and it is up to each of us to really choose how we're going to use that voice. And so we're, uh, one of the things, like tomorrow we have a workshop, and the workshop that we chose, the title we chose was really Empowering Truth Tellers. And the reason we chose that title is because it's not enough that I know that this is fake news, but I also have a responsibility to go out and, and uh, amplify the truth to my spheres of influence. So if there's anything that we want out of all of these talks as a citizen advocate is for us to be able to touch each and every citizen, each and every one of you, and to tell you that your voice matters and it's how you use your voice. The collective voice of everyone can change policy. We've seen it happen in small instances, and we know that this can happen in big instances. And if we can only discover what that is and how we will make our voice a collective strong voice, then I think uh, there is really hope for us. You know, as you go out, <coughs> sorry, yes. Um, I'm Edna Aquino from Babae Ako, which is a social media platform 
uh, campaigning against misogyny of the Duterte government. Um, this is a follow-up question to Glenda. I think I really like, not I think, I really like the idea of more collaboration, more coordinated efforts to push back um, the disinformation campaign that's going on. Um, however, on, on the other hand, we know that uh, what makes Duterte and all these uh, forces behind him um, have gone into this position of power now is partly because of cynicism of the public. And so one point of view, for instance, is that cynicism sits on the failure also of the democrat democratic institutions that we have built after EDSA 86. So the question really is, in your aspiration of more collaboration, do you see the need also of self-reflection by the media, meaning not only the social media, but also media in general, and be accountable for the failures that have taken place where you have played a role? Because I don't think that we can, fa we can counter uh, cynicism by just focusing on the excesses or abuses of the current administration without owning that accountability of the past? Oh, definitely. I think um, I agree in Dai that it's not, it's the failure of, a lot of practically all the democratic institutions here um, that explains where we are right now, and that includes the media. The media um, for each company um, in the newsrooms, they go through all this um, self-flagellation. I think part of the mistake would be they don't make that public. Their self-criticism remains internal. I, I guess the challenge now is precisely to include the public in that self-criticism. That's one. Um, second, um, just the mere corrections page. <laughs> you know, you, you have to apologize when you commit a mistake. Um, when you err, you got the wrong spelling or whatever, uh, then that has to be very aggressive. Uh, I think those internal mechanisms should be in place and be uh, made public uh, so that the public tends to appreciate that. There's got to be more truth-telling among us, which I think we haven't really quite done well. Um, there's got to be more opportunity beyond discussing this information as a problem, but really our internal processes as well. Um, there's got to be, and this one has always been, you know, I've, I've been a journalist for 30 years. There's always been this debate on whether or not you should call out a corrupt colleague, right? Parang, in a way, sometimes we're no different from Congress. When a politician is exposed, they tend to protect the institution and they say, oh, you cannot arrest Remember this, this congressman who was arrested for gun running? And he said, well, I remember the late Bonnie Gallego. I respected him so much, but you know, he even joined that, that petition that said, oh, you cannot investigate Congressman de Guzman. Oh my God, my, my years, my age is showing. So they, they don't know this, uh, high millennials. So I guess sometimes we tend to still be protective of the industry, right? And which, which uh, the public is taking us to account for. And so, yeah, um, expose the corrupt, if we must, uh, rather than just whispering about these things. Like, and maybe Justice Conchita can help us expose the corrupt as well. <laughs> well, I think we're nearing the end for wrapping up. And um, this panel has a, uh, maybe has the, um, you know, the, the most burdensome responsibility of all to talk about, <laughs> you know, the whole of Philippine democracy. And I'm also stepping out of, I mean, I have a background as, as a political scientist, actually, so I'm not completely stepping out of, of what I know. Um, but this is a big thing. This is a really big thing, thinking not just about how the media can correct itself, but, but how to have an impact that s strengthens and, res and restores Philippine democracy. So w with that big thought in mind, perhaps we could just wrap up, beginning with Jane. Uh, I think I've said everything, but uh, maybe, I think be being a social media person and a blogger, that's, that's my space. 
um, I really just want to, to reiterate that each and every person here who has a social media account uh, has an influence. And uh, if you are able to step out of your comfort zone a little bit every once in a while and really reach out to your uh, spheres of influence, meaning the circles, no? And, and when I say circles, it doesn't only include those that are online. Our spheres of influence, including people who are offline, people that you have in the house who don't have internet, people you meet at work, people in school, in church, wherever, uh, that they are still within your spheres of influence. And, uh, and we can really, you know, in, in your own little way, it may be a small way, but it, if each and every person does that, I think there's really the possibility of this uh, ripple effect and this amplifying of uh, good things that can hopefully neutralize whatever we are ranting about these days. So uh, I think that's the only thing, really, that uh, we need to wake each and every one up. I think I'd like to end, and I wrote this down because um, this is where I got it wrong, but I wrote, I was asked about this um, last year and I submitted a very short academic paper on the prospects for the 2019 polls. And so I'll say it now because I got it wrong. Um, the 29 midterm polls will be an incentive for a broad pro-democracy coalition to grow. Also, for the moderate tendencies of President Duterte, who will want his allies to win national and local seats. This will somehow constrain him from making drastic measures that could deprive his allies of the policy outcome of election victory. He will be forced to negotiate with the opposition to fulfill campaign promises and temper continued criticism of his regime. That's all. I got it wrong. May I go after the judge? Well, I thought I should uh, ask every one of you to stand up and be counted. Let's forget that voice in the wilderness, lone voice in the wilderness. If by your collective, by our collective action, we can make a tad of a difference to arrest the proliferation of lies, we shall be able to have a good night's sleep. Thank you. Um, I really have nothing else to add, but I would like you to look under your seats if there is a picture of a t-shirt, you get one of these. Here. Sorry, <laughs> here now, join the audience only. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, panelists, and our um, moderator, Stephen Butler. We are going to now go into a short break. Uh, yeah, especially while they're doing their selfie. We, we'll do a short break. Uh, there's refreshments and coffee downstairs again.